Hello and welcome to Commodore 128 Assembly Language Programming. Uh, we're going to be continuing on with the worm program today, so might finish it today, I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. So, let's take a look at things left to do. Um, we want to display a score. Uh, when we left off last time, we displayed just a, just a simple message saying play again, yes or no. Um, we want to display a score with that and then take a take an answer to that and then either start the game over or end gracefully um, we're gonna need a print numbers routine that will print the score that will take a 16-bit value and turn it into a screen value print that on the screen and I'd like to make the make a boot disk that someone could pop into an actual Commodore 128 well pop into the drive like a 1571 drive and uh, just automatically run the game without having to do the, um, you know, sys without having to, to run a particular memory location like we've been doing all this time. So those are the things to work on uh, for this time. For the the message in the screen, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this end message here, and we'll turn it into a series of lines. So. We'll have one line that says game over. Um, let's see. One that says the score. And one that says play again. For now, we'll have those three lines, and then I want to. Um, pad these with some spaces. Actually, well, I don't want to pad that. I'm going to pad these out with some spaces so that everything is sort of centered. Now the score one will have to have room here for the score, which could be <coughs> excuse me, which could be up to three three digits, since the since the worm could get up to something like 900 characters long, so there needs to be room there for three digits. So that's how we'll pad that. So if we go back to up to where we actually use that. Okay, here's where we printed that end message. So the first one's going to be end message one. So let's um, let's do that three times. The next time will be for end message two, which will drop down one line. Twenty-eight and hex will be one line, and then end message three will drop down again another another line. And so that'll print those three lines on the screen. Now they're probably not going to be centered quite right. We'll have to shift that once we see where they actually end up. But that's going to print those three lines in a block on the screen. Um, okay. So that's one thing. Now, at that point, it's going to wait for a key. So we can change that. Let's put. Let's just leave the breakdown here at the end. All right, now wait for key. We modified wait for key so that it doesn't really wait for a key. It waits only a second for a key and then goes ahead and presses a key for you if you didn't if you didn't press. So that's the that's the key press we we've got during the game now. At the end of the game, we say play again. We don't want that. We just want to wait for however long it takes for the person to press Y or N. So we're going to need a different wait for key routine for that, and I think I'm going to change the name of this one to um, Game Key Press. And we'll say wait up to one second for a key press. Put an A. If time runs out, repress last key. Okay. So that's going to be called game key press. Then we'll take that same thing, call it wait for key, and this will be our one that just does um, that doesn't do all the timing stuff. This will be going back to what wait for key used to be like when it didn't do that. So this one just needs to well we're gonna we're gonna be changing this one because this will do the the Y and N thing. In fact, we'll call this wait for wire in. Okay. Um, 
because it's not going to wait for just any key. It's going to wait for a particular, you know, one of those two keys. Um, we could write a general, you know, we could have a general wait for key routine and then have wait for wire end wrapped around that. But I don't think we're going to need to wait for a key press it for any uh, for anything else in the game. So that would just be overkill. Um, let's see. So where are we using wait for key right now? Okay. So this this needs to become um, game key press, and then this will be wait for Y N. All right. So wait for YN needs to compare, um, let's see, I have to think about how the, how the uh, logic works here. So we load A from the key press location, compare it to 88, branch back up here if it's 88, or actually that needs to be a branch of equal back up there because that means no key has been pressed yet. Then. We don't need this load A, so we don't need the last key stuff. If it falls through here, that means we got a key. And yeah, if I remember right, the way wait for key used to work, we pushed that on the stack then, and then we waited for the key to be let up. So we would load A from key press, compare it to 88 again, and branch if not equal back up to there. Okay. So the first time we're waiting for something that's not, you know, we're waiting for a key press, we get it, we push it on the stack to save it, and then wait for the key to be let up, and then we have the, you know, then we have the key press. So now based on that what do we, you know we need to decide what to do so we can compare it to a y and to do that we're going to have to go to our one of our manuals here if i can remember which one we're going to have to know the screen um not the screen value the the key press value and i'm not actually sure now that i think about it which book it's in actually the the easiest way to find out would probably just be to do a little basic program here. Um, let's see, what is key press right now? Okay, key press is D4, so print peak. Um, decimal. D4 okay yeah and then 20 go to 10 this is just a very very simple little and you'll see it's printing 88 because we're not holding any key down right now if I press Y it shows 25 and if I press N it shows 39 so that's a simple little way to find out what a key press value is um, okay, so we want to compare it to um, 25, <clears throat> and I'll leave that in decimal because that's what the, the basic program has given us, um, pressed Y, and let's see, we'll branch ahead if it's not equal to Y, which means the stuff for Y goes right here. Okay. Um, so we'll branch ahead of that and put the put the check for like, let's go ahead and put that in. Then we'll compare it to thirty nine. Then if that is not it, we want to branch all the way back to wait for n, wait for y n, and start waiting for another key. I don't think we're gonna, you know, we're not gonna try to. If they press something other than y or n, we just ignore it. I think probably is the thing that makes the most sense. 
so otherwise it's gonna do let's see otherwise it'll do the end was press stuff right here all right so let's look at the logic of that again if y is pressed it branches ahead or no if if y is not pressed this won't be equal so we we'll compare to y if it's not equal to y we branch ahead to here compare to n if it's not equal to n either then we'll just go back up to here um, at the end of the y thing we'll need to re well we won't need to return necessarily because we're going to do something else but let's put a break in there just to remind ourselves that we do have to do something there. We don't want to, we don't want to check for n after we've successfully found that it was y. All right. If n was pressed, then we just want to quit the game. And we'll get into what the possibilities are there. If y was pressed, we want to start over the game. Now, we can start over the game by just jumping to start, right? Um, that's probably going to be the thing to do. We'll just do a jump to start and it'll start over setting up the screen and everything. Um, there is just one issue with that though. Um, let's see, where are we at? The issue is that, I mean, that is what we're going to do. But the issue with that is that we're a few layer we're a few levels deep in jumping to subroutines at this point um, we jump to wait for n or wait for y n from from end game and we jump to end game from collision and we jump to collision from print head and we jump to print head from main loop so we're like four levels deep in uh, recursion, which or not recursion, but we're like four levels deep in subroutines, which means all, the, all those return locations are stored on the stack. And if we just jump back to start, then the stack is already partially full compared to the original time. And so if we play let's say I, there might be some other stuff pushed on the stack at that point but let's say all there is is four return locations that'd be eight bytes each one's an address takes two bytes so that's eight things that have been added to the stack then we play another game eight more things have been added to the stack play another game eight more things have been added pretty soon you're going to crash the computer because you're going to fill up the, the stack space and it's going to it's going to overrun into other stuff so if we're going to do that um that's not a problem but we have to fix the stack before we start over. Um, we've got to put the stack back to where it was back up here the first time we hit start. So um, I think the thing to do is going to be to just try it once and make sure. I think it's going to be 8 bytes, but we can make sure that... Um, that it is basically we can make sure that we've got the right number there because what we're going to want to do here is I'll just put in a comment for now restore stack to where it was when game started and by stack I mean the stack pointer not the whole stack itself we'll just call it SP for stack pointer <clears throat> and then we can jump to start and then everything will be clean and back to the way it was um okay but we'll have to figure out we'll have to you know we'll have to figure out how to do that um okay well let's do that let's go ahead and do that much to see if i've broken anything yet oh label not leftmost column on line 303 got quite a few lines at this point I really should spend a little time figuring out how to get it to get Emacs to obey those labels. Um, okay. So, load worm here. And let's just, let's see. I guess we can just run right into the side. 
and it said game over. It didn't say the other stuff. That's interesting. I'll have to figure that out. Um, and then it broke out. So stack pointer at that point, well, okay, I'm going to have to put a break in and uh, and see some things. Right there, the stack pointer is at F0, um, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, all right. We need to put a break in at start, basically, which is at the beginning of the program, because that's where it's going to jump back to. So let's do that. Okay, let's reset everything. Do a hard reset. That'll get our stack back to where it should be. So the stack right now is F3. All right. So let's um, put a break. Okay, I've got a break already. That is, did I just do that? Um, I guess I did because it didn't break last time. All right, so our stack is at F3. We've got to remember that. Now let's go ahead and run until we go run into the side. And the stack now is at F1. So it really didn't, it really only moved. So there's, there's an issue that's not, not where I expected it to be. Because only one thing got put up, pushed on the stack, so something something broke out before it even got to our. Well, that's the thing. Something broke out before it even got to our wait for wait for thing. It looks like there's a problem printing out the end messages because yeah, I've got something wrong here. Let's see. Yeah, I've got some branch if equal to pluses, and I've got no plus for them to jump to. I wonder how I've expected that to work. Load A with end message, branch of equal plus. Okay, so that goes to here. Wonder why. I don't know. I must have deleted something without realizing it. Um, so the way these work, you load Y with the index zero, load A from the message location indexed by Y. You branch of equal, meaning if you hit the zero at the end, go ahead and you're done with that line. Otherwise, you store the character at the location indexed, increment y, branch if not equal, back up to here. Okay, so that looks correct. That all looks correct. All right, so now we'll get past that point. Um, assemble. Load it. Okay. So now I can run into the side. All right, it printed game over, your score, play again. Now if I press N, it ignores me. If I press Y, it ignores me. Why is it ignoring me? Must be something wrong with the wait for YN routine. Um, we're at 14B3. Uh, let's back up a little bit. 14A0. Fourteen B three would be that's loading A from the key press, so it's in that routine. Something must not be matching, or there's something wrong with my logic there. So let's look at key. Wait for YN again. All right. Loads from the key press location, compares it to 88, branches of equal back up to here. That seems like it should be correct. And then it falls through. Oh, sorry, I think. Yeah, right here. Okay. Yeah, that was dumb. I pushed the I pushed the actual key press on the stack, right? Because I need to then check the next key press and wait for it to become not the key again, you know, for it to go back basically to wait for the key to be released. Then I've got to get the key back off the stack. So right here, I've got to get that key back. I think I had that in the original routine, but um 
we changed that to do the game key press thing and then we didn't need that anymore so we, we do need it here because we want to wait for key release to actually do the thing based on the key so since I wasn't getting that back I was actually always comparing to to 88 right here and uh, that was never gonna never gonna match okay go on run into the side play again okay hit no and so that just breaks that's all that's all we've got happening there um, yeah well it returns and then hits a break because because that's it was hitting this break right here after it came back from that um, okay so we haven't actually done anything with the N yet so that's fine um, what we want then is to test the Y version of it so once again I'll run into the side I hit Y okay and it came around to the top then and I hit another break. So the stack pointer is seven less than it was at the beginning. So let's continue. We'll play again. Hit Y again, it breaks again. That is, let's see, C, D, E, F, zero one two so that's seven again so I'm adding or subtracting seven from the stack pointer each time so if I'm gonna put the stack pointer back I'm gonna need to add seven to it I'm not sure why it's seven that's a little puzzling um, let's see if we look at it right now the stack pointer is at BB which Let's see, here's 8, 9, A, B. So right now it's F, A, 19. No, it's, um, no, that's 8, 9, A, B. So this is the next open spot. So that means right here has been pushed on 13, F, A. 13, F, F was pushed on. Okay, so 13, A, 5 has been pushed on, but this was pushed on as some other value. So there must be a, there must be a push A happening somewhere in one of the you know I said there's four levels I guess only three of them the, the fourth level isn't calling anything else and so there's really three levels that we got to deal with but there's also a value being pushed on the stack just as an individual value at some point so um, let's see if we can tell where that is yeah it's gonna be one of these places um, because we're calling that's well, not in draw border but yeah it's probably going to be in print head because yeah we're pushing a on the stack and then we're calling collision which calls something um calling collision which calls end game which calls wait for key but that that initial push value was still was already pushed on the stack so if we're going to start over We've got to just, you know, we've got to tell it to ignore all that stuff. So let's go down to wait for YN. So now we know what we have to do. We have to reduce the stack pointer. No, we have to increment the stack pointer by seven. So the simplest way to do that, or one way to do that, is probably just to load an index register with seven pull a value off of it let's see if I already no wait a second I gotta stop and think here because well no we're we don't need a anymore we've already we've already learned that a was a a was y at this point and so we don't care what a is anymore so I can I can clobber that so we'll pull a off the stack that'll increment the stack pointer by one um, decrement X branch if not equal back up to here which will be here and that should do it that should do let's see that'll do it on seven and then on six yeah that should do it seven times 
So... Um... We've got to do that before we jump to start, though, and that's... Uh, I was a little confused for a second there. Like, wait a second, that's... Yeah, so there's where... And then that can go away because it can't get past that jump. So... We increment the stack pointer seven times by pulling seven values off the stack, and that should restore our stack back to the, the condition it was in, or store the stack pointer at least back into the condition it was in when we started the game so that we're ready to start again without um, without filling up our stack and causing it to run over. So let's try that. Okay. Right now the stack is BB, which is fine. We, we, only, we just want to know that it doesn't change when we hit the beginning again. So run into the side, say yes, and now our stack is back to BB, and we're back at the beginning of the, of the game. So that is good. Let's do it one more time. Let's, um, well, let's do it. Let's run across some numbers this time and just make sure that that doesn't somehow change this equation. I don't think it should, but let's run across a couple. Play again. Yeah, we're back to BB. Okay, so that's good. So our stack is clear at the beginning of the game when we restart the game. All right. Um, so that, I guess, is done. Now we just have to deal with the, the N, the graceful quit of the game. Um, like I was saying the other day, a lot of games didn't have any sort of graceful quit. They just, you know, when you wanted to stop playing, you just turned the computer off because they just didn't do that. Um, I guess I would like to have some kind of graceful quit. Um, one way to do that is to jump to the beginning of basic. I believe there's a vector there. Um... Let's see, let's check the book. Uh, we want the want the memory map. Oops, went too far. Yeah, I believe at four thousand is the cold the cold start. Yeah, there it is. The cold start vector for for basic so that basic well basically um let's just try that i'm not sure if that does everything we want to do but let's jump to four thousand okay and then we don't even need this return anymore because nothing can get to that point it's either going to jump back to start or it's going to jump to four thousand okay So right into the side, play again, no, there we go. So that's a nice clean start, just, well, <laughs> there's something I had forgotten about. Um, let me add that to the thing here. Um, clear keyboard buffer when exiting game. Alright, so let's go ahead and do that now. Uh, we want to do that right here before we jump to basic because otherwise basic then immediately goes to the keyboard buffer to see what's been typed. So we want to clear that. And I think if we look at the memory map here some more, uh, there's a value in... Hopefully it won't take, be too hard to find, but I think there's a value in zero page here that tracks how many items are in the keyboard buffer. Um, D4 here is the current key index. D5 is the last key index. Uh,
Yeah, well, let's search a little bit. I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time hunting through the book for this, but um, I also don't, I don't want to leave it till next time because I'm not sure there's going to be a next time. I think we might be done with this here. Um, keyboard buffer size. Okay, A20. Remember that A20. Let's make a note. Considering my sh my poor memory, we will keep that handy. Um, okay, yeah. So there's that's the thing. There is a routine running in the background every every sixtieth of a second as part of the interrupt routine that is also checking the keyboard. Uh, location the key press location and building this keyboard this 10 key keyboard buffer and so that's why we can get up to 10 keys just suddenly coming out at the end so um, if we set that keyboard buffer size actually that might not be keyboard buffer index at d0 might actually be the one that we care about um, let's go back to memory map d0 what is it called index to keyboard q um, let's go over here to the monitor yeah it's at zero now which probably it probably increases as the keyboard buffer is filled I think if we just set that to zero when we quit the game then that will that will fix it, or at least that's the thing I'm going to try first. So let's load A with zero, store it into D zero, and see what happens. Okay, run into the side. Yep, that did it. Okay. So that basically, otherwise that D0 is going to have a value, meaning how many keys up to 10 have been stored in the keyboard buffer. If you tell it 0, then when BASIC starts, it's, it figures the keyboard buffer is empty. It doesn't matter what's actually in those 10 byte locations, because they're going to get overwritten then anyway. All right. So let's look at the list here. What have we done? We ask if play again. That's done. We haven't displayed the score yet. Um, so we'll have to finish that before we can mark all that off. Um, we have cleared the keyboard buffer when exiting. We still have, we'll make a boot disk last. That'll be the last thing we do. Um, okay. A couple of things I want to do. This one isn't probably worth adding to the list. We'll just do it. We're, right now we're starting kind of over to the right. I want to start more in the center of the screen. So if you figure the screen's 40 characters wide, we're starting on character like 32 or something like that. So if we subtract 12 from that, let's try and see if that puts us in the center. Um, we're starting... Let's see, where do we... And that's right here. We're, start, we're loading 0 as the low byte and then six as the high bytes. We're starting at 600. Let's start at five and then subtract Y or subtract 12 from this is gonna be um, F, uh, F4. That'd be five less. Start at five F4 instead of 600. Um, should get us closer to the center. I'm going to go ahead and try. That's a small change, but whoops. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, hexadecimal. There we go. That seems pretty centered. Oh, maybe it could go one more to the left. Of course, it can't be in a perfect center because that would be between two cells. But I think we'll, we'll call that good. Um delete our breakpoint because I keep having to 
break through it. Um, okay. We're printing the end of game thing. That, that also needs to be centered. That was the other thing I was thinking about. Um, the end message needs to be centered. So let's go ahead and run into a side here. All right, I'd like to push that over and down. Um, I guess four, four lines down and a little over to the left. Um, right now we're starting the first one at 500, so if we came down, let's see, four lines down would be 160 characters. Come over to the left a bit, you know, call it 150 characters. Um, 150 in is 96 in hex. So let's come down to 596. And then if we add 28 to that, uh, 2 and B, I think. Stretching my hexadecimal skills here a bit. Um, adding 2 8 to that. B, C, D. Alright, let's try that and see if I did my math right there in my head. Run into the side. Uh, I did not. It looks like the second two are lined up, but not lined up with the first one, and the first one could come over to the right a little bit. So let's take another look at that. So this one could come up to, let's say, 9A. Now if we add 28 to that, 8 plus A, A is 10. So... If you add 8 to 10, you get 18, which is 2 in hexadecimal. Carry the 1. Carry the 1, you get 10 plus 2 is B. That seems right. So why is that one not in the right place? i got to be figuring something wrong here. Um, Okay, well, let's see what 59A is. I think that's about the right location for the first line. 59A. That's two. That's 2632 in decimal. So let's 2632 plus 40 be 2672. That'd be A7. Wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. What am I thinking? No, I want to move. Twenty six seventy two. Oh, no, I'm no, sorry. That's that's octal. No, I. It's because I was at the wrong... Here, you, you put a tilde, and then you put the thing, 59A, and it converts that. Okay. Sometimes because of the way the assembler doesn't go to the next line, or has already gone to the next line, things get indented funny. So 1434 is the location in decimal. So then if I do it in decimal, 14, add 40 to that, 74, 5C2. Okay, for some reason I just wasn't adding enough, wasn't adding another one well enough, or another, anyway, 5C2, and then this is going to be 5EA, I suppose. Okay, run into the side. Okay, that's pretty good, I guess. Seems fairly centered. 
Um, it looks a little off because it doesn't have a score in there. And I may eventually, I may want to spread these lines out. They're kind of tight. I may want to put a space in between them. Um, in fact, let's just do that. Let's go down to the bottom here. Um, let's make this all spaces. And this one all spaces. This will be three, four, five. Um, in fact, let's oh, actually. We only need this one. We only need the the space one once because we'll just reuse it. All right, so two will be the one with the spaces. Or actually, let's swap those around. One will be the one with the spaces, and then the others will be the, the text. All right. All right, so we're gonna wanna move this one up one. So five, nine, A minus 40, if we take 40 off of that. Um, Let's see, I said 59A was 1434. So if we check 1494, that's 5D6. No, wait a second, 1394, sorry. 572. Okay. And then, so we'll do a blank line, then we'll do and message two, which is the first text line. Then we'll do a blank line again at five EA. And then we'll do and message three This could, I mean, you could, you could reorganize this into some, into a loop of some sort. I don't know if it's really worth that just for this game over screen. Um, you could also just design the whole, the thing as an entire screen, and save that somewhere. But then you're using a whole K of memory for that. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we print in message one, which is our blank line. We print in message two, which is the first line print end message one again is the blank line and then end, me end message two again or and then end message three then end message one again which is a blank line and message four and then end message one one last time okay so now I just have to fix the addresses here so we start out at seven two and then go to C that just doesn't seem right no, it isn't right. There should be one in between there. So this one should be C2. This one should be 9A. Okay, so then we add 28 EA. This is going to become 2, but this is going to become 6 something. So let's see, from 5 EA, <clears throat> that's 1514. So if we add 40 to that, we get 15.54, that's 6.12, okay. Then if we add 28 to that, we should get 6.3, or yeah, 6.3a, and then 6.62, 6, I believe, okay. All right, let's see if that all lines up. There we go, that looks better. It was a little cramped before. And there's space around it now so that if, if the screen is full of worm parts, it will carve out a space for itself because of, because I left a space on the left and right end of each line plus the end message one that gets padded at the top and bottom. All right.
So we've got that, so it looks okay. Um, now what's next? We got to print a score. All right. This was the this was the thing that sort of I hit a wall on this last time just because I hadn't been thinking about it and wasn't sure what direction to go with it. <clears throat> I've got this print numbers routine that I had written a while back for a for a video where we just wanted to print a number and it uses the the kernel routine to output text to the screen. Now, we're not going to use that because just because we're not. Um, so so this is just going to become routines for printing numbers. I, I already copied this from another file so it's not we're not trashing anything that was there for a previous video. Um, this this print numbers dot a is new. So this doesn't need to bank anything in. We've already done that. It doesn't need to copy anything to the dividend location because we're going to take care of that. This this is just going to be a little routine that sits in between the main program and the and the division program, which is this one, which also needs to be changed. It doesn't need to be a full program anymore. Um, so this is just a routine and it doesn't need this. So but what our main program will need to do is store the dividend at the dividend location and store the divisor at the divisor location before and the divisor is going to be 10 because we're we're uh, dividing a number by 10 so that we can print it so that's ready to go um, let's see here we set the divisor that's fine because it's always going to be 10 for this print routine but we don't need this because um, we're just gonna say place the div place the number 16 bit number to be printed at the dividend location okay before calling this so this doesn't need to do that so print 16-bit can just set the divisor to 10, sets a counter. Okay. Now we don't need my number down here anymore because that was that was in there as an example number that we were that we were doing. Um, we don't. This needs to be 16, not 32. Um, okay. So, now, the way this works, just to refresh my memory and I suppose yours, is this stores the divisor, the dividend is already stored, and then it sets a counter for the number of digits that are being figured out, because you've got a 16-bit number, it could have, in our case, it, it can't have more than three digits, but a 16-bit number potentially could have up to five digits, up to 65, 536. So you have a counter to count how many digits you're, you're finding as you divide it out, because the way it works is you divide it by, you divide the original number by 10, you push the remainder on the stack and increment your counter, and you keep doing that until you run out of number to divide. So you're pushing the digits on the stack, bottom one first. And, you know, the, the rightmost digit goes on the stack first. So when you start popping them back off the stack to print, you're getting the largest, you know, the largest digit first. So if your number is 12,345, the five gets pushed on the stack first, then the four, the three, the two, and the one. And when you start pulling them back off, you get them in the order you want to print them in, one, two, three, four, five. So when we get to here, this is where we were just calling the, the, the kernel routine bass out. We're not going to do that. We want to actually print it to a particular location on the screen. Now, that means this is also going to be an issue here because we don't want to do that. Um, or at least that's not the value we want to add, most likely. Um, I'll leave that alone for now. but. What we want to do is just put it in a particular particular location in screen memory. And so what I'm going to do, and 
The thing is, we don't want we don't want to hard code this routine so that it will only print to one place on the screen. We want to be able to give this routine a uh, an address and say start printing it here. So what I'm going to do for that is um, we'll place the address to start printing at that is our start printing in and let's go back to worm and see what we've got available at this point in the game you know the, the game is over at this point the only the only number that still matters is length because that's the number we're going to be you know printing as our score so we can use any of these other locations as as our as our you know as our pointer now to print to screen memory so Let's just use head p for that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna overload b6 basically and use it for two different things at two different times when we know they won't conflict with each other. So b6 b7, um, and we'll call that um, print location. Okay, so our so our main routine will need to set up that address, copy the 16-bit number to the dividend location, and then call this call print print 16-bit, and then this should take care of it. Um, and so we're going to come down here, and here then we need to store this thing into the location pointed to by print location comma y, because that's how your that's how your indirect storing works now now we have a problem why my indentation is completely different I must have been doing this in a different program not Emacs at the time it's weird um, or I wasn't using assembly mode but anyway now there's a problem because I'm using Y as my counter and I'm counting down um, so that's not gonna work I can't use X. Well, you, you can't do this in this indirect indexing with X anyway. But I can't use X as my counter because I'm already using, or no, I used X up there. But aren't I using X for something else? No, I guess I'm not. Okay. So I could use X as, well, no, I am. Yeah. I can't. I can't start with X up here. I can't have. Right now I'm using Y as the counter for the whole big loop, and then I'm using X for this small loop on the inside. So they're, they're both busy, is basically what I'm getting at. So if I'm going to use Y here as my index, I've got to free up Y. I can't be using Y for this counter. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go down here to the bottom of this and set up an address, um, a byte value called counter, and that'll be um, where we're going to have our counter. And that means here we're going to store this. Now this is going to annoy the crap out of me if, any, if everything isn't. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll worry about lining things up later. But um, let's see. Let's let's call it print counter because I might have used the word counter somewhere in the main routine. That's one thing about assembly. You do. You, you don't have really local variables the way you do in a higher level language where you can assume that well because this is inside this routine it's a local variable it doesn't affect anything outside this routine um, at least not in this kind of assembly with, where you're not setting up a stack for every separate function and all that kind of stuff um, you have to just keep track of okay I use this variable name somewhere I need to make sure you can, in the assembler actually, in this assembler, you can set up zones, and I should probably start doing that and show an example of that. Um, you can set up zones and say within this zone, you know, the, ver the, the variables, the labels used within this zone don't, don't affect outside this zone. So you can do that with this assembler. I just haven't been doing it because it's been too small a project to really need that, but we probably will when we get into a bigger thing. All right, so... That means then here instead of incrementing y, we okay. Let's let's don't be stupid. We increment y. We're going to increment 
print counter instead. And then when we decrement Y, we'll decrement print counter instead. Okay, that should be all we need to do to free up Y so that we can use Y here as we pull up pull off the digits. So let's before we start loop two, let's load Y with zero because it's going to be our index thingy, and then we'll store into that. And then before we decrement the print counter, we'll go ahead and increment Y so that if it has another one to print, another digit to print, Y will be one more so when it gets to here it'll print in the next location. Okay. That all seems right to me. Um, going through that kind of quick and I wasn't really sure what was in this file <clears throat> exactly so hopefully I'm not missing anything important. Um, so that's print numbers <clears throat> which calls div 16 by 8 which we've got ready to go. So now our main routine before we call when we're ready to print out when we're ready to print the, the number then when we're ready to print the score we need to copy length to the dividend location and put the address to print it at in print loc print loc okay so let's go back to worm then and find the the end. Um, or let's see, where were we printing that stuff at? Right here, okay. So after we print that stuff on the screen, then we want to print, then we want to fill in the score. Alright. So before we, before we wait for Before we wait for YN, we want to fill in the score. So the score line is the is end message 3, and so that starts at 5EA. And then if you count over, so if this is 5EA right here in the space before your, then this is EB, EC, ED, EE, EF. F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7. So we're going to want to go to F7 and start printing there. <clears throat> okay, so note to myself here. Um, okay, so at this point we don't care we don't care about any of our registers and so I can use whatever, whatever register I want. So load A with <clears throat> six store that into print lock plus one that's the high byte load a with f7 store that into print lock um, okay so that sets up our print location that we want to print the the number two now we've got a copy from length to dividend so let's load a from length store it in dividend uh, I don't remember if, I don't think that was cop capitalized I'm, I'm gonna need to I'm gonna need to make up a, a uh, length a, a style guide for myself basically so that I start sticking to some particular style rules before we uh, uh, tackle the next big thing um, print did I call it 16-bit? I did. Okay. Alright, get rid of the note here. And then the plus, let's see, after they all branch of equals, so this would be the plus that was there. Alright, so after printing all the lines, then we wanted to do this set up the set up the print location copy the copy the length into the dividend location to be divided and then print 16 bit and then wait for the key okay that seems correct let's try that whoa all kinds of stuff going on um, 
I must not be including oh I'm not including that file yet I'll bet yeah that makes sense print numbers a like I said it'll probably be necessary at some point at least if a game requires it or an application to just make up a, li a library of number routines to do a bunch of different things but for this I don't want to get I don't want to get a whole bunch of stuff in there that we don't need um, you know keep this keep this small okay 194 using oversized addressing mode what did I do wrong 194 Print location plus one. Uh, what would be wrong with that? One night, both of those lines it doesn't like. What's wrong with print lock? Wonder if it's because I don't have that set up. If that's, if it has something to do with the fact that that's included later. Although, well, I wouldn't think so. It's not complaining about dividend. So what doesn't it like about print lock? It's not complaining about this, but it is complaining about this. How does that make any sense at all? Is something wrong with my addressing? How I'm addressing it? I don't see that. I wonder if it could be if that could be like a re reserved name in the in the assembler. Let's call it print L, just for, just to see. I don't wouldn't think so, but let's try that. No, still doesn't like that. Now it doesn't like more things. <laughs> when I, oh well, it's complaining about the same thing over and over. And then it's also complaining about line 50. Okay. Yeah, because of that. Hmm. Using oversized addressing mode. I don't get what it's getting at there. Dividend isn't zero page, but I don't see why that should matter. I've been using zero page stuff all this time for other things. I do have a mistake here, but I don't think that's it. I was I was loading or I was storing A instead of loading it, but um, still doesn't like that. Loading A with six, storing it into print lock plus one. Why is that a problem? Why won't it just store it into B seven? was because it didn't know about that location yet because it was in the file that's included later. I, I actually thought it would pick that up anyway, but I guess it doesn't. 
say this one picks up things like dividend even though they're in this file that gets sourced so I'm not sure why well anyway, maybe I'll read the assembler documentation later and see what the deal is with that but let's move this up to the top um, in fact since print location is well let's just let's just do that all right I'm already up to an hour and I wanted to try to get this done in an hour but it's not happening so I don't want to spend too much time on that figuring out something I don't understand about the assembler um, okay so is that ready what did we just do we just okay so we we're printing the score and that is at here so printing the score in our end game routine it's possible I should have made a print score routine and split that out but that's okay it's not too terribly long yet alright so let's see if it prints the score when I hit the wall and the score should be six it did not print or well it may have printed but it printed um, if it printed it didn't print uh, characters we can see so that's gonna be the next question is why did it not print that so um, <clears throat> location and then jump to here and wait okay so we need to look for F7 in the code H is H will hunt for a value so 1431 that can be pretty handy for finding something in, in code once it gets a little longer so 1400 We'll start there. The H will search between two locations for a byte and tell you where it found it. So, um, 1431, so let's keep going. All right, so right here is where we're setting that stuff up. So we load A with 6, put it in B7. Load a F7, put that in B6, and then we load the length value and stick that into C100 and C01. All right, so we want to put a break then at 14.3b, I guess. We'll break right there. Let's start over. All right. Okay, so now we've stored. There's our print location, 6, 6F7, and um, oops, M, not B. Whoops, what I do? C00, C01. Okay, and there's, uh, what did I, what did we copy there? Oh, the length of the worm, okay. So the worm, the length is there, and the print location is set up. So let's step. We step into our print routine. Then this is going to take a little bit to get to where it does anything. Um, okay, it sets up the quotient. sets up the loop yeah that's gonna take a little while um, let's 15 e0 um, come back to the code here um, print 16 bit so we're getting we're getting there and everything looks okay. So let's go into print numbers, print 16 bit. Um, I think 
that should be okay. And then we get down here. Um... That's something else that's, uh... Okay, yeah, that's where I am. So add, add with carry 30 and then store that at the location. That's right here. Now, like I said, the add with carry is probably, gonna, is probably not what we want because we're printing screen values instead of, um, instead of the values that you would pass to the kernel routine um, bass out so we have the actual zero you know we have the actual length as a number or the the digit as a number and so the question is what's the screen value for that number um, we've got to go back to the book for that um, and figure out where been before that. I know it's in the appendices. Okay, so there's the ASCII codes. So you add 48, which is 30 in hexadecimal, to get the ASCII code, but we want the screen code. And so we want to add the same thing. Huh, that's surprising. They're in the same place. The letters are different. The letters are in different places, but the numbers are in the same place. Okay. So that should be okay then, the add carry 30 in hex. All right. So then the question is, is it going to print it to the location? Or I'm, basically we're, some, we're messing something up and it's gonna be right in here somewhere probably that's getting messed up. Um, so I think I wanna put a break right here and then step through this stuff V8 be a good spot because I don't think we've got there yet um, yeah we're gonna have to start we're gonna have to start the game again Okay, it broke in the f broke at the first spot. That's fine. I'm gonna continue. Uh, it's not getting to the next spot. That's interesting. Hmm. It didn't reach my second break point for some reason. So it didn't reach 15b8. which is that load Y right here. So why would that be, if it's coming into this routine, why is it not hitting that? We're calling print 16-bit. Dividing by 10, jump, jump to loop two, which is, oh, oh, oh. That's the problem because I need to. Well, it's okay. So right here, then I'm gonna need to make sure y is zero because I don't know what might be happening to y off in div 16 by 8. We can check. I mean, I don't think. Well, that doesn't seem to use y. <sighs> um, but anyway, this this were, that will never get hit because it jumps right here. It either jumps back or this jumps forward to loop two, and then right here we branch back to loop two. So before we jump to loop two, 
we need to load y with zero just to make sure about it. I think it should be zero anyway. Um, here, let's start fresh. Alright, run into the side. Alright, we stopped at the first breakpoint, which I don't care about. And it's not getting to the second breakpoint. It's not getting to. Um, it's not getting to 15b8, which actually that's prob that could be a different thing now. 15b8 because I moved thing. Yeah, that's that doesn't even make sense now. Um, 15. Let's try b0. So let's delete and let's. What do we got for breakpoints? Let's delete both of them. And let's set a break at where it pulls A out. 15BA. Set. Yeah, that's right there. And so that will that's inside our loop, so we should be able to see it work each time. Okay. So let's reset it. And go to 1300. Okay. Uh, now I, I got something stuck. What did I do? Hmm. Checker breakpoints, 15BA is the PLA. Okay, so let's start the game. Run into the wall. Okay, so we're at PLA. So let's start stepping through. We pulled the six, and that's what we expect to get. We pulled the six out of the stack. Cleared the carry, add that to it. Store that into B. Store that into indirect B six comma Y. So let's see what's at B six and B seven. O six F seven. Okay. And that happened. So that should have stored it into and Y is zero. So that should have stored it into O six B seven. So let's check that. O six B or. 06F7, sorry. Yeah, it's there. Strangely enough, that's right next to a to an asterisk. I must have figured the I must have figured that location wrong. 06F7, because that's that's back up to 06F0. That replaced one of the asterisks on the screen with there it is I yeah the six is on the screen it's just not where I expected it to be it's way down here on the lower right I don't know if I don't know if you can actually see my my mouse pointer in the in the video but anyway it's it stuck it down here so the problem so it is printing it it's just in the wrong place you know that's kind of a relief because that looked like it should all be fine. Um, so we just need to get the location right. Uh, what's wrong with 06F7? If we're printing end message 3, and that's the one we want to add it. Oh, it should be 05F7, not 06F7. That's all. Let's delete our break. I don't think we need that anymore. Run into the wall. Actually, we can just run into ourselves. That's faster. Your score is 6. Yay! Big score. Um, okay, let's run in. Let's get up to a double digit score at least. Make sure that it prints correctly with double digits. And then If it prints two digits right, it should print three right. And I can check that when you're not waiting on me. 
Um, nobody wants to sit and watch me play this until I have a hundred, a length of a hundred. I don't suppose. Okay. Yep, fourteen. Okay, good deal. So the length printing works. The score works. If I say no, it goes back to basic. That works. All right. So. Uh, What's left? I'm gonna tr I'm gonna get this done this time I think if I can, because there isn't enough left to make another video of. So we've got our print numbers. We've got the split. We've got the score displayed. Uh, all that's left is to make a boot disk. Okay, this is kind of a cool thing, and that's why I wanted to do it and show it off. Um, the Commodore 128 when it boots up. Um, the 64 didn't do this, but the 128 does. When it boots up, it checks the disk, the, the first disk, the uh, device 8. It checks the first disk, and it checks the first sector on the disk, which is track 1, sector 0. And it checks it for certain values. It, it loads it into the cassette buffer, which I think is C00. We, we don't care about that, because by that point, we don't care if it clobbers something we had there. Um, and it... Uh, it checks the first three bytes at that location and if they are CBM which was short for Commodore Business Machines then it knows it found a boot sector and then it does some some things based on that um, if we check one of the books here this one is the Commodore 128 book one internals or Commodore 128 internals I don't know why it's called book one because it doesn't say that on the on the uh, cover anywhere but this talks about um, the boot routine and there are a lot of different possible things that can do you can stick code in it you can have it load other blocks off the off the um, disk stuff like that what I want to do is fairly simple I just want to save my program as a as a program on the disk and then I want to have the boot sector automatically load and run that program and so to do that first thing we've got to do is say okay how large is the program um, where does the program get loaded in at and that's easy to tell when we load it because it tells us it goes from 1300 to 1648 and so we can do then is in the Commodore over here in the monitor we can save that well first first we got to create a disk so you probably won't be able to see this as I do it because of the way the um, because of the way OBS captures the disk. But if you go to create and attach an empty disk in the in the Vice Commodore One Twenty Eight emulator, it will let you create a disk and um, just create a regular D sixty four as a disk image. You could also make it a D seventy one or D eighty one, whatever you want to do, depending on what kind of um, disk drive you would eventually want to put this in. I'll just make a D64 because that'll work in any in a 1541, 1571, whatever um, that people would be most likely to have. So I'll call it worm D D64 and I'll save that. Okay, so now I have a disk and it's attached to device 8. Um, if I exit the monitor I can get a directory of that disk. See, I called it worm. I gave it my initials as the ID for the disk, A, B, and then it has 664 blocks free because there's nothing on it yet. Okay, back to the monitor then. We can save a program then on that disk called worm, and we want to save it to, to device 8 um, from 1300 to 1649, which you always give it plus 1. Um, for some reason. So we're going to save from 1300 to 1649 to a file called worm on device 8. And it's going to do that at good old Commodore speed at the time. Um, Alright, so now that's saved on our disk. So now if we check the disk, there's our file. There's our program called worm. It takes up a whopping four blocks, so it's still less than a K apparently. Um, well, yeah, it says over here it's 348 bytes. It's nowhere near. Um, that must be. Well, that's in hex. Never mind. So, anyway, it's less than a K. Now we just have to set up the 
the um, the boot block to um, boot that. So we do that with a program called C1541, which comes with the Ace or no, it comes with the Vice emulator, and this lets you attach the thing, let attach the disc, the D64 disc. And then you can look at it and do all sorts of various things with it. It's got help in it to let you do whatever you want to do. You can see the BAM, which is the the um, sector that tells you it's, it's basically track 18. Tells you what's used on the disc right now. Nothing basically is used um, except for those four blocks. Um, you can look at. Um, you can look at a block, so we'll look at the boot block. So this is track one, sector zero, and that's what it looks like. It's just empty right now, and so we want to put stuff in there. Um, so you do that with B poke. So we're going to B poke into track one, sector zero, offset zero, meaning to start at the beginning, and we're going to put in. Um, let's see, C is. Um, Four three, I believe. I'm going to put in hexadecimal values here for everything. Four two, and then four D. I believe that's going to spell CBM, and then you follow that with four zeros. And let's go back to the book. We're going to need the book handy for all this. Um, okay, so you get the CBM identification code. Then you follow that with a memory address for boot sectors, configuration index for boot sectors, and a block counter for the boot sectors. We don't care about any of those, so we're just going to leave them set to zero. And as long as you leave the block counter set to zero, it knows you're not looking to boot up any more boot sectors. And so then it goes to a message which follows that, and it just prints out that message. And it prints it out following the word booting. So before I, when I tried this once, it was... Uh, it, w it printed booting booting because I didn't know it was already going to print the word booting. Um, so we just want to put a message in here um, about, we just want to put the word worm basically. Um, so I don't know what the character for W is going to be. Let's just, let's say it's 5D. Um, or let's say it's 5A. And O is going to be M and O. So if, if 4D is M, actually let's Let's look at it. Block zero, one zero. Yeah, so the CBM came out right. The Z is wrong. So if 5A was Z, W, X, Y, Z, so we want to subtract 3 from that, that's going to be 7. Um, o is M, N, O. O is 2 more than M, and so that's going to be 4, D, E, F. Um, R O P Q R that's going to be three more let's try five two and then M again and then a zero because you have to end the the message with a zero also okay so there's that now the last thing you have to put go back to the book so is then the name of the program to load which in our case is going to be the same thing as our boot message so we'll put the we'll put worm again this is this is now the name of the program that it's gonna load off the disk and terminated with a zero back to the book now we just need a chunk of machine language that will do that will jump to the beginning of our code because that just loads the code into memory it doesn't necessarily run it so now we need to jump to the beginning of our game so let's find out what a jump command Let's use the monitor over here to, let's just assemble a little bit of code and say jump to 1300. Okay, now we can see the the machine language then for that is 4C0013. So we'll add that to this here, 4C0013. And that's our code then that the boat, that the boot block will run. Okay. So if we check this then, we start with CBM, that's what tells it it's a boot block, otherwise it just ignores it and, and goes to your ready prompt. And then it prints out the worm, prints out the message worm, and then it 
loads the program called worm that's why it says worm twice and then it jumps to 1300 which is where we load the program up at all right so that has now changed the boot block on our disk so let's reload the disk and again you won't be able to see this but I am reloading the worm disk that we just created and changed the boot block on and now we will reset the computer so that it goes out and finds that and it says booting worm and now the game is running without me having to you know load the game or go to a location or anything and we run around a bit run into ourselves your score is 20 play again yes let's play one more time Now, one thing about this is if you did, you know, if you were playing this, when we quit and go back to basic, it's going to automatically load the game again because the game is still in the drive. You would have to take the disk out, or in the case of, you know, uh, an emulator like this, you would have to detach the disk. So, you know, by making it automatically boot off the disk, we're not going to get back to a ready prompt. We're going to get to another booting, but that's okay. Like I said, people, you know, with with these systems, people were used to the idea that, you know, when you were done with the program, you just reset the computer, you just power cycled. But I kind of like the idea of not requiring that, and just resetting. So, score 42, do not play again. So it's going to reset, it's going to boot. And there we go. All right, back to our notes here. We've made the boot disk. Everything in the notes is done, so I think I'm going to call this one done. Um, I will push the I'll push the D64, the the disk that we just created. I'll put it in the repository, so that you know it'll be there if anybody actually wants to just download this and put it on a physical disk. I don't have a Commodore 128 to do that with myself. Um, maybe I'll get one one of these days, but um, that's that'll be available. Plus all the source code and everything. So. This was fun. Um, I don't know exactly what the next project's going to be. I think it'll be. I, I do have one thing I want to start. It's it's not a game. It's a it's a hash calculator. It's going to be kind of dry stuff. I'm not sure about doing that right away. I might do that as sort of a sideline along with another something that's more fun. Um, so I'm certainly up for suggestions if anyone has one. But I I want to tackle a game that's more complicated. Something probably that uses sprites and. Uh, and more graphics um, that you know this is just character based so I'd like to get into some bitmap gra graphic stuff and some sprites and uh, do something a little more challenging now that we've uh, now that I've got a handle on some of this stuff so that is it for this time we're up to an hour and a half but um, we got it done so um, hope this was interesting and if you want to discuss any of this um, hit me up in the comments or go to the reddit group the reddit uh, um, subreddit, whatever they call them, um, the C128 one, and I do check in there. So, um, have a good day, and thank you for watching.